You are listening to By the Book, because if you don't look at the world through the Bible, you will never see it right. Welcome to By the Book. This is Alan Griffith, your host for episode 95. I'm glad you're with us today, and I hope you've been with us for the last few episodes. We've been talking about the world. We've been talking about the temptations that come with the world, the lust of the eyes, the lust of the flesh, the pride of life. And we've talked about how to uh, avoid the temptations and the fact that provision has been made for us with the work of the Lord Jesus on the cross of Calvary. You and I don't have to follow the pathway of the world. In fact, we are told as we've seen in 1 John chapter 2 that if we go the way of the world, the testimony is that we really don't have the love of the Father in us. And that's a challenge. Uh, that's that's heart-stirring, because I think uh, if you're a born-again Christian, you'd like to think that you truly do love the Lord and that you have a testimony of loving the Lord. And that's how I feel about myself. And yet the Bible makes it very, very clear if we go the way of the world, you and I are are battling lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, pride of life. We're not only battling, but we are losing the battle, losing too often, then that's quite a, a testimony against us. So I want to talk for a few moments about the fact that while we are battling with these temptations, and we are sometimes worldly, we tend to forget that our role here, our purpose for life, is that we are to glorify God, and a part of that, glorifying Him, is to recognize that we have been sent to the world. I've probably said this before or suggested it before, but I'll talk about it again for a moment. If you're a Christian, imagine that you got saved and immediately went to heaven. And you got to heaven and the Lord said, I'm glad you're saved, I'm glad you're here, but now I'm going to send you back down to that world. And you and I might think, why? Why? I just got here. I'm saved. Thank you for saving me. Now you're sending me back down there? And God would say, yeah, I'm sending you back to the world to be a testimony for me. I'm not sending you back to the world for you to gain worldly things, for you to get caught in the temptations of the world, for you to serve and surrender to the prince of this world, I'm sending you down there to be a public ambassador for me, to be involved in telling other people about Christ and the fact that they need to be saved and they can be saved. That's why I'm sending you. Well, you know, I would think that that would really impact us when we got back down here. I think we would understand the only reason I'm here is God sent me here to be an ambassador for him. Well, you know what? When you get saved, you don't go immediately to heaven. You're left here. But you and I have been left here to be that public ambassador for God. Let me read to you from John 17. We're not going to be here long, but I want to read to you portions of John 17. And you may know that John 17 is what we often call the true Lord's Prayer, not the prayer that he gave to the disciples. We call that the Lord's Prayer, but we probably ought to call it the Disciples' Prayer. The Lord's Prayer is the prayer that the Lord Jesus himself prayed to his heavenly Father the night before he was crucified. Again, John 17. Now he's praying in anticipation of his death, resurrection, 
and ultimate ascension to heaven. And he's praying in anticipation of the fact that when he goes to heaven, we, his followers, we who are saved, will be left in this world. So I want to read to you, beginning in verse 14, here are the words of the Lord Jesus praying to the Father. He says, I have given them thy word. That's his disciples. That extends to us. I have given them thy word. And the world hath hated them because they are not of the world, even as I am not of the world. What a statement. What a statement about us. We are not of the world. We are in it. We are not of it. And the Lord Jesus said, we are not of it, just as he himself was not of it. So verse 15, I pray not that thou shouldest take them out of the world. And that's kind of what we alluded to in our illustration. What if you got saved and immediately were taken out of the world? Well, the Lord Jesus, as he prays, prays to the Father and says, I'm I'm not praying that you would take them out of the world. I want you to leave them here. I want you to leave them in the world. Verse 15 goes on, but that thou shouldest keep them from the evil or from the evil one. And that's the whole discussion we've been having for the last few weeks. That's the point. We're in the world. We're not of it, but we need to stay away from and avoid the evil one who is the prince of this world. So we're in a battle here. Verse 16, they are not of the world even as I am not of the world. And then he said in verse 17, sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. So he's praying while I'm leaving and I'm leaving my disciples here on this earth, leaving them in this world. I'm praying, Father, that you will keep them from the evil one And on the other hand, I am praying that you will sanctify them, that you'll set them apart and do it through your truth. And in fact, your word is truth. And then verse 18, and this is the verse I've been working toward. Here's what it says. As thou hast sent me into the world, Even so have I also sent them into the world. Do you think the Lord Jesus Christ ever lost sight of the purpose for which he was in the world? Do you think he ever got distracted? Think he ever got on the wrong road? Absolutely not. And so here he says, as he prays concerning us, As thou hast sent me into the world, even so have I also sent them into the world. And you and I need to view ourselves. Again, if you're a born-again Christian. Now, if you're not a born-again Christian, you need to get saved. Because if you're not a born-again Christian, you are in the world and you are of the world. You're part of this worldly, ungodly system that is run by the devil. Get saved. But if you are saved, then you and I need to realize, I'm here because I've been sent here. I have been sent into this world, and I have been sent here by the Lord Jesus, even as the Father sent him. The Lord Jesus Christ was sent to this world with purpose, and he fulfilled it. He lived it out, and you and I need to get hold of the purpose for which we have been sent here, or I think I can say it legitimately, the reason we have been left here. Well, what was that reason for Christ? Well, he was here 
for the sake of redemption. He was here for the sake of salvation. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. You and I are here to give that message. That's why we're here. That's why we've been left here. And again, the warning is we dare not get entangled in this world and its system so that we have no testimony for Christ. And so that our life is not all about living for and lusting for the things that this world has to offer. That's not why we're here. I've really been burdened lately for the unsaved, for individual unsaved, some to whom I have tried to witness, some for whom I'm praying. And boy, I'm begging the Lord to save people. I believe we're in the end times. I really do. Jesus Christ is coming back. He could come back at any time. He could come back today. I believe it with all my heart. And then as I, I think of this, and especially in light of the fact that I've, I've known some people who passed away recently who had no evidence of being saved and would not profess to be saved, but they died, and they're lost, and they're gone, and they're not coming back, and they'll not have opportunity again to come to know Christ. And so I've thought as best I could about the reality, the reality that the lost person is facing when they die. And that's why you and I are here. That's what our life is all about, that we might reach people to see their eternal destiny changed. And that has to be the focus of our life, to see people who are lost and say, how do I reach them? Well, one of the things I think that has motivated me more than ever is to think again of the fact that there really is a place called hell. That's being denied more and more, uh, the whole idea is being mocked. And sometimes there are Christian preachers and teachers who try to minimize the concepts of hell, deny the realities as they are presented in Scripture. But they're presented in Scripture because the Lord wants us to face those realities and then face the need to get as many people to Jesus Christ as possible. And so I turn to Luke 16, beginning in verse 19. This is not a parable. This is a true experience. No reason to believe it's a parable. A true experience. The Lord Jesus tells the story beginning in verse 19. He says, There was a certain rich man which was clothed in purple and fine linen and fared sumptuously every day. Now, this man was not right with God, as we're going to see. And his wealth the luxury he enjoyed had nothing to do with what would be his lost condition. There are many wealthy people, well-off people who know the Lord. So wealth in itself doesn't condemn someone. Wealth can get in the way. The Bible lets us know that. Wealth can be something that people stumble over they think they're okay, they don't need God, but wealth in itself never condemns anybody. But we're given a description of this man, a real man, 
He was clothed in the best. He ate the best. He had the best. Listen, he had the best of everything this world has to offer. Verse 20 says there was a certain beggar named Lazarus. There was a man named Lazarus. He was a beggar. He had nothing of what this world has to offer. So this man, Lazarus, was laid at the gate of the rich man, and he was full of sores. He desired to be fed with the crumbs which fell from the rich man's table. Get this picture. Uh, there was no government help back in those days. Actually, there's too much government help today. But there was no help or hope available to this beggar. And so somebody, we don't know who, but somebody evidently assisted him and got him to the gate of the rich man's house. And he, he was laid there. He was left there. He was sick, full of sores is the way it's described. And he laid there desiring to be fed with the crumbs which fell from the rich man's table. He evidently had no way to provide for himself, or they would not have had to bring him and lay him at the gate. And so he's, he's laid out there hoping that somehow the leftovers from the rich man's table would get to him so that he could survive. And then it says, moreover, the dogs came and licked his sores. Try to get that picture. A man laying at the gate of a wealthy man, he has nothing, he is sick. Dogs come, they're licking his sores. He has nothing. And as we might expect, his sickness was unto death. And verse 22 puts it that way. It came to pass that the beggar died. Now, the beggar, as we will see, knew God. He had nothing of what the world had to offer, but he knew God. He was a saved man. Being saved doesn't mean you end up with a lot of worldly wealth. But he was a saved man. He dies. And I love this. Verse 22 says, he was carried by the angels into Abraham's bosom. You know, if you're a Christian, when you die, you will be carried by angels into your heavenly home. I remember a lady I was talking to one time about her salvation and about her death. And she said, well, when I die, how will I know where to go? I love that. When I die, how will I know where to go? And it was wonderful to tell her, when you die, the angels of God will be there. They will meet you. They will carry you into the very presence of God. Now, at the time this parable was given, nobody had actually gone to heaven yet because nobody went to heaven until the Lord Jesus died. But they went to a place called paradise. They went to a place referred to in this text as Abraham's bosom. It was actually one portion of Hades. The term Hades is rendered hell in our Bible. But the term Hades comes from the term to see, preceded by the negative. In other words, 
The term Hades, to see, is Adon in the Greek, and then the negative prefix. And so Hades was the place of the unseen, and that would be from an earthly perspective. People would die and go somewhere, their body buried, but the person went somewhere, just like today when somebody dies, we do something with the body, but the person leaves the body. Well, here's Lazarus carried by angels into Abraham's bosom. A portion of Hades, a portion of the place of the unseen, where the saved went to find their comfort, not yet going to heaven until Christ died. Well, it says this then in verse 22, the rich man also died. I got a feeling he lived on earth as if he thought he would never would die. But he died, he was buried, and then verse 23, and in hell, that's the term Hades, in this place of the unseen, nobody knew where he was, nobody could see him, but in hell or Hades, he lifted up his eyes. People say, well, what's it like when somebody dies? You know, if, if they're alive, what, uh, what senses do they have? Well, it's interesting that we don't fully understand it, but this man had senses. He had eyes. He had the ability to see. And he lifted up his eyes, and he was in torment. Listen, there's a place called Hades eventually into hell, and it is a place of torment. You die without Jesus Christ, you go to a place of torment. And then he looked, and there he could see Abraham afar off. He's in Hades, he's in a section where there's torment, there's another section, that's where Lazarus is, it's a place of comfort, so he sees Abraham afar off, and Lazarus in the bosom of Abraham. Lazarus in, is in the place of, of comfort and joy. In verse 24, the rich man cried and said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me and send Lazarus that he may dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue, for I am tormented in this flame. Now, I want to tell you something. There is no joy in reading that verse, but it is a reflection of reality, whether we like it or not. Here's a man who died unsaved, and he is suffering, he is in torment, and he is crying out that this beggar Lazarus could dip the tip of his finger in water somehow get to this rich man and let that cool water touch his tongue because he said, I am tormented in this flame. Folks, that's a terrible reality. That's a terrible reality. There is a place called heaven there is a place called hell. Right now, Hades, eventually Hades will be cast into hell fire. But there is a place where people go. The man saved today is taken by angels into the presence of God. The man unsaved, very much alive, goes to a place of torment and suffering. Verse 25, But Abraham said, Son, remember that thou in thy lifetime receivest thy good things, and likewise Lazarus evil things, but now he is comforted, and thou art tormented. The rich man wasn't being tormented because he had been a wealthy man. 
He was tormented because he never knew God. He was tormented because he was a man of sin who never got saved. And Lazarus wasn't comforted simply because he did not have much in this life. He was comforted because he was saved, evidenced by the fact that it was the angels of God who met him in his death and carried him to the place of comfort. So verse 26 says, And beside all this, between us and you there is a great gulf fixed, so that they which would pass from hence to you cannot, neither can they pass to us that would come from thence. So we're not dealing with heaven and hell per se. We're dealing with a place called Hades, where there is a section of comfort, there is a section of torment, but a great gulf fixed between them. And Abraham says, nobody can get out of where they are. People talk today about, you know, talking to the dead, the, the death, dead coming back to talk. No, no. If you ever had that kind of experience, you were talking to a demon. You weren't talking to your uncle or aunt or grandmother or whoever. Verse 27, then he said, I pray thee therefore, Father, that thou wouldest send him to my father's house. The rich man says, if, if Lazarus cannot come, and comfort me, then would you send Lazarus back from the dead so that he could go to my family and tell them about salvation? Verse 27, I pray thee therefore, Father, that thou wouldest send him to my father's house. Listen, for I have five brethren that he may testify unto them lest they also come into this place of torment. Well, what is it that the rich man wanted Lazarus to testify of? What did he want Lazarus to do when Lazarus came back to the earth? Of course, it wasn't going to happen. But what was the rich man hoping for? He was hoping that Lazarus would come back and tell his brothers how to get saved. But listen to verse 29. Abraham saith unto him, They have Moses and the prophets. Let them hear them. Abraham says, I want to tell you something. They have the same Bible that you had. You didn't pay any attention to it, and that's why you are lost. And if I sent Lazarus back and he tried to tell them that he'd come back from the dead, he said, I want you to know something. It couldn't happen. It won't happen. And they have the same Bible that you had. You ignored it. They're ignoring it. Verse 30. He said, Nay, Father Abraham, but if one went unto them from the dead, they will repent. And he said unto them, If they hear not Moses and the prophets, if they won't believe the Bible, neither will they be persuaded, though one rose from the dead. And as you know, one did rise from the dead. And that's the Lord Jesus Christ. And people today refuse him. They mock him. They refuse the Bible. They refuse to get saved. And they're going to go to a place called hell unless they come to Christ. Well, what's that mean to you and me? because there are millions and millions and millions of people who are lost. Yea, there are billions of people who are lost. They're not all going to be saved. In fact, few of them are going to be saved. But you know why you and I are here? And I'm talking to you, hoping that you are saved. Do you know why you and I are here? To tell them. Nobody's coming back from the dead to tell them. Lazarus isn't coming back. You and I are here 
not to get engaged in all the worldly things. You and I are here to tell people about Jesus Christ and that they need to be saved, to tell them how to get saved. And our time is about gone, but I just want to ask you, and we might come back to this next week, what are you doing to reach people for Jesus Christ? What are you doing? Not only what is your church doing, what are you doing? We may talk about it more next time. Lord bless you.